My name is Avi Don Cover. I'm a professor of law here at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and uh, I'm very happy to be one of the co-moderators of this panel. Um, as many of you probably know, Henry Kissinger uh, once observed that academic politics are so vicious because the stakes are so low. <laughs> Our conference, of course, rejects that Kissingerian dry observation with real sincerity and vigor, uh, but not without perhaps some hubris and pomposity that the academy is engaged in very high stakes. Uh, and some of our panelists, Mike Newton, certainly noted some of the very critical ways in which uh, academics and, and some right here have played very critical roles, stepping out of the ivory tower um, and researching and collecting uh, information, providing evidence of key import uh, to real work on international matters. And the pal panelists we have heard from valorize rightly the role of the academy in seeking mechanisms for accountability, limiting statist assertions of unlimited power, and proving significant adjuncts to the development of international law. Uh, Layla, for example, noted uh, previously, in addition, of course, the, the role of academics as, as, as providing significant critiques. But let's not be mistaken that academics play equally significant roles in legalizing and underscoring abhorrent and vicious militant state action, that they may work to seek avenues for evading accountability and legitimate and justify these actions under the very same banner of the rule of law. For every Raphael Lemkin or Hirsch Lauderpact, there may well be a Carl Schmitt. Even academics' legal arguments and narratives of an American judiciary suppressing a legally deviant executive can minimize the long American history of suppressing marginalized groups in the name of security. So the academic's halo may not shine as bright as we always herald. There are wild and abundantly diverse ideas that come through the freedom of academic research, analysis, and expression. Our panel examines the role of the academy as a source and means of change and innovation through the crucible of the post 9-11 response of states, particularly the United States. Uh, and I'm thrilled that we have a number of panelists. I'm not going to go too deep into the details of their distinguished uh, biographies, but just uh, introduce them. Uh, we have Jeffrey Korn, who is the Gary A. Kuiper, Keeper? Kuiper? Kuiper, Distinguished Professor of National Security at South Texas College of Law in Houston, Texas. Prior to joining the South Texas College of Law, Professor Korn served in the US Army for 21 years as an officer and a final year as a civilian legal advisor retiring in the rank of lieutenant colonel. He's the author of a number of significant articles and books, including The Law of Armed Conflict and Operational Perspective, and The Laws of War and the War on Terror and National Security Law and Policy, a student treatise, as well as Principles of Counterterrorism Law. Deborah Perlstein is professor in law and co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy at the Cardozo School of Law. Her work on the US Constitution, international law, and national security has appeared widely in law journals and popular press. And in 2021, she was appointed to the US State Department Advisory Committee on Historical Diplomatic Documentation, a nine-member board of historians, political scientists, and US foreign relations law experts who help ensure the timely declassification and publication of government records surrounding major events in US foreign policy. Um, I'd also add that she served as the founding director of the Law and Security Program at Human Rights First from 2003 to 2007, where I had the great privilege of getting to know her as my boss uh, and mentor. So I'm thrilled to have her here. Uh, Jessica Wolfendale is the department chair and professor of philosophy at Marquette University. Her primary research focus is the ethics of political violence and the moral psychology of state-sponsored violence. Her most recent book, War Crimes, Causes, Excuses, and Blame, was published by Oxford Press in 2018. And she is currently working on a book project on the toleration of torture and terrorism in the criminal justice and national security context. And finally, my co-moderator, um, who led a terrific event yesterday, is Shannon French, the Inamori Professor of Ethics here at Case Western Reserve University. Shannon came to Case Western in 2008 after teaching for 11 years at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis. 
Her publications include The Code of the Warrior, Exploring Warrior, Warrior Values, Past and Present, and numerous other articles. Uh, I'm very pleased to invite Jessica to share with us uh, her comments first. Thank you. So I'm going to set a timer, and I timed this this morning, and it should be 14 minutes and 36 seconds. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So first of all, I just want to thank Shannon for inviting me to this event. I'm really honoured to be here. It's a privilege to be on this panel with... Ooh. Ah! Out of time, Sorry, I out of time. Um, <laughs> at this time. Oopsie. Um, and also to be invited to contribute a paper for the Law Journal. So... What I, when I started thinking about this project, the first thing that occurred to me was how 20 years after the events of 9-11, basically none of my students had, n had ever heard of Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo Bay. And that was true even back in like 2011, actually, that was already happening. And I suspect this general ignorance is, is pretty much the norm among a large swathe of the general public as well. So... <sighs> This, what I'm calling this sort of erasure of the existence of the US torture program from the general public and pol political awareness is really quite remarkable. And it's compounded by the fact that none of the primary architects of the torture program, so including senior CIA and Bush administration officials who designed and implemented the program and the psychologists who were involved in designing the methods, none of them have faced legal charges or really any serious professional repercussions for their actions. And the Obama administration actually blocked most kinds of accountability for the architects of the torture program. So, I mean, I share there's the criticism of the Obama, Trump and Biden administrations for their failure to hold the perpetrators and architects of the program accountable. But my aim here is actually to situate specifically the erasure of the post 9-11 torture program within the history of torture and the erasure of torture in America. So many scholars have argued that torture actually, specifically the torture of non-white people has long been a method through which the US has enforced, both at home and abroad, what I would call moral, white moral citizenship and the myth of what Joanna Esch refers to as civilization versus barbarism. But I think there's been missing from this discussion an exploration of the role that the erasure of torture and the public and political narratives that support that erasure have played in that function. So I'm going to argue here that the use of torture and the erasure of torture are both essential components in the ongoing enforcement of the normative boundaries of American white moral citizenship and the continuation of the myth of American goodness and civilization. So I'm going to focus first on three case studies of American torture. This is drawing on the work of historian William Fitzhugh Brundage and law professor Dorothy Roberts uh, to look at the torture briefly of indigenous Americans, enslaved people, and the use of torture by US troops in the war in the Philippines in the early 20th century. And these three case studies will demonstrate how torture, American torture has from the very earliest days of its use, functioned as a mechanism for the enforcement of white moral citizenship based around this myth of American civilization versus barbarism. Next, I'm going to draw out some common patterns of justification and erasure from these three cases of torture and then show how these patterns are replicated in the political, media and academic narratives and erasure of the post 9-11 torture program. Finally, I'm going to argue that the erasure of torture from public and political consciousness not only serves to promote the myth of essential American, specifically white goodness, but it permits the continued use and denial of torture against non-white people in domestic contexts, including the prison system. Okay. So, just to move on to the function of torture in American history, while President Bride Biden recently claimed that, quote, torture goes against everything we stand for as a nation, end quote, the use of torture in America began in the earliest days of colonization, continued through the institution of slavery, extended to the use of solitary confinement in the 19th century, which continues to this day, and occurred during the war in the Philippines, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, and the War on Terror. So looking specifically at torture during colonization, slavery, and in the Philippines illustrates the function of torture in creating and reinscribing white moral citizenship and the myth of American civilization. 
So first of all, uh, one of the most persistent narratives that you see when you look at the history of torture is the idea that torture is a necessary defense against a barbaric and uncivilized enemy. So as William Brundage explains during the early days of colonization, torture was often utilized against indigenous peoples and was often justified as part of extreme violence that was claimed to be necessary against, quote, a people of vicious and ferocious habits who know no law but force, as a contemporary commentator put it. And this characterization of torture as a sort of necessary means of dealing with a, a savage or uncivilized people is echoed in the justifications offered for the torture of enslaved people. So it was claimed at the time during slavery that torture was actually necessary to enforce discipline among slaves because slaves had, quote, dulled sensibilities and a lower pain threshold than white people. Because torture was reserved only for those whose barbaric or so-called uncivilized ma nature made them appropriate targets of torture, the use of torture also reinforced this myth of civilization versus barbarism. So as Roberts puts it, to quote, torture functions to mark the bodies of brown-skinned victims as savage objects undeserving of civilized legal protection, end quote. Because people of African descent were portrayed as sort of naturally brutish and uncivilized, it was also claimed that slave owners really had to resort to discipline, to violence, excuse me, had to resort to violence to enforce discipline. Now, it was also claimed that if slave owners exceeded the bounds of so-called reasonable torture, then they certainly could be rightly criticised, such as the uh, LaLaurie family in New Orleans, but it was claimed that most slave owners were just and compassionate to their enslaved property and that the torture of slaves was motivated by compassion and necessity and not by cruelty and sadism. We see this narrative of torture as a defense against barbarism recur in the early 1900s during the US invasion of the Philippines. So after rumors began to emerge of the use of torture by US troops, a Senate investigation in 1902, quote, produced increasing evidence that torture had been an integral part of the colonial war, quote, end quote. In response to the findings of that report, President Roosevelt defended the US invasion and claimed that it represented, quote, the triumph of civilization over forces which stand for the black chaos of savagery and barbarism. Members of his administration also suggested that if torture had been used by US troops, it, quote, might be justified by the frequent violations of the rules of civilized warfare committed by a barbaric and treacherous enemy. Um, and that's a justification that we actually see recur almost word for word in the defense of torture against members of uh, suspected terrorists in the war on terror. So within two years, though, of the US Senate report, the scandal of US torture in the Philippines had almost completely receded from public and political consciousness. So there were war crimes trials for some officials and soldiers accused of torture, but none, even those who were found guilty, served any prison time. And President Roosevelt was re-elected in a landslide in 1904. So there are obviously important differences between these case studies that I can't go into here, but I think all three illustrate a distinctive pattern that has four elements. So firstly, the use of torture is characterized as a necessary evil that good people are forced to resort to because of the barbaric or uncivilized nature of those with whom they are dealing. So in the case of torture during conflict, like in the Philippines, the use of torture is thereby characterized as an aberration, as something that doesn't reflect on the character of American people. So this construal of torture as a necessary tactic against a barbaric enemy reflects and reinforces the myth of civilization versus barbarism. Secondly, we see that torturers are, mo are depicted as being motivated by necessity or even by compassion, as in the case of slave owners, and not by sadism and cruelty. Thirdly, few if, any, few, if any, of those who engage in torture are held legally accountable for their actions. Very few slave owners were ever held accountable for the torture of enslaved people. And as I mentioned earlier, in the case of torture in the Philippines, even those who were found guilty of war crimes face no serious repercussions, let alone imprisonment. Finally, the fourth element of this pattern is that aided by the lack of accountability, the use of torture is basically effectively erased or disappears from public and political awareness. So for example, for many decades, the torture, genocide and enslavement of indigenous people was forgotten or deliberately misrepresented. Since the abolition of slavery, many public accounts of slavery, such as those that appear in high school textbooks, fail to address or even mention the use of the scale and nature of torture that occurred during slavery. And indeed, some textbooks actually portray slavery as fundamentally a benign or benevolent institution. 
In the case of the war in the Philippines, we also see a counter-narrative emerging, which not only erases the use of torture by US troops, but characterizes the war in the Philippines as a helpful case study. So, for example, at the start of the war on terror, military and foreign policy experts argued that the US experience in the Philippines could provide valuable lessons for fighting guerrilla and insurgency forces. So it doesn't take much more than a cursory glance, I think, to notice the similarities between these four elements, these justifications and erasure that I've just discussed, and the public, media and political discourse around and erasure of the post-9-11 torture program. And I think the sim similarities with the case of torture in the Philippines are particularly striking due to the shared nature of a conflict, uh, shared context of a foreign conflict. So first of all, one of the key narratives that emerged very soon after 9-11 is a version of this myth of civilization versus barbarism. So as Jennifer Esch explained, the Bush administration and then political and media commentators drew a distinction between the so-called barbaric Islamic terrorism and American civilization. So, for example, Attorney General John Ashcroft affirmed at the time, quote, the attacks of 9-11 drew a bright line of demarcation between the civil and the savage, and our nation will never be the same. And this narrative of depicting Al-Qaeda as a uniquely savage and barbaric enemy then plays a significant role in justifying the resort to torture. Sorry, I've just lost my spot for a moment. Okay. Additionally, because Al-Qaeda was depicted as this barbaric enemy that posed a potentially existential threat to the US, the resort of torture was represented as unprecedented. So, for example, James Mitchell in his memoir, he's a psychologist who helped design the Enhanced Interrogation Program, talked about the CIA heading into, quote, uncharted territory with the development of the program. And this characterization of the CIA's program as uncharted not only ignores, ignores the cases of torture I've just mentioned, but actually erases a long history of specific CIA research into torture techniques, use of torture, and training of torturers in Latin and South America. And this narrative as torture is unprecedented also deflects attention away from the function, the historical function of US torture in enforcing white moral citizenship, because it frames the use of torture as this one-off event dictated solely by the considerations of necessity. But like the torture of indigenous people, enslaved peoples, and in the Philippines, the post-9-11 torture program and the narratives used to defend it reinforce white moral citizenship by targeting non-white peoples who are classified as savage or uncivilized and thereby, quote, acclimates the American public to the infliction of pain and degradation on non-white bodies. That's from Dorothy Roberts. Additionally, again, similar to what we saw in the case of slavery, uh, the narrative of torture as an aberration sustains the myth that the use of torture doesn't reflect negatively on the character or values of Americans. So, for example, in the aftermath of the revelations of Abu Ghraib, President Bush asserted that, quote, the abuse did not reflect the nature of the American people. And we see this claim that the post-9-11 torture program was motivated only by duty and necessity and not by sadism or punishment in the contributing, contributing authors to, this is a really awkward title they chose, rebuttal the CIA response to the Senate Intelligence Committee's study of its detention and interrogation program. <laughs> so in that book, uh, General Michael Hayden, former director of the CIA, quote, admitted there had been abuses early on when untrained folk had been sent into the field in emergency situations, but he claimed that, quote, the CIA detention and interrogation program was launched out of a sense of duty, not enthusiasm, end quote. So we can see a similarity between this narrative of the 9-11 torture program as motivated by duty, necessity, and professionalism, and the narrative made, uh, put forward by slave owners who depicted you know, reasonable, compassionate torture as something that was necessary to be used against enslaved persons. So just like the slave owners made a distinction between you know, excessive torture and reasonable torture, the torturers and architects in the post-9-11 torture program viewed themselves as morally good, even virtuous, in comparison to the bad apples who acted out of cruelty and sadism at Abu Ghraib. So to wind up, I've demonstrated, or I've argued, that American torture has long functioned to sustain and reinforce the boundaries of white moral citizenship and the myth of civilization versus barbarism. And I have shown that the political and public narratives that sustain this use of torture across American history 
form a repeating pattern of justification, lack of accountability, and erasure from public and political consciousness that's replicated in the 9-11 torture program and continues to this day. So I just want to conclude by making a few remarks about the ongoing impact of this erasure of torture on people of colour. So the narrative of torture as a deviation from American values, which we saw echoed in Biden's most recent comment, contributes to the erasure of the history of US torture and obscures the fact that the torture of non-white peoples is embedded within American norms and always has been. Torture in America has always been used to effectively mark the difference between white and non-white, between barbarian and civilized, and between citizen and non-citizen. So the narrative of torture as a deviation not only allows the American white public and political leadership to continue to pretend that torture is fundamentally un-American, but it facilitates the continued torture of non-white people and others who are deemed morally inferior and the ongoing dismissal of such torture. Oop. I've got two, like one more minute. <laughs> so the erasure of torture is in fact a core component in the continued use and toleration of torture. So I think this is particularly evident in the ongoing, um, ongoing, the erasure of the ongoing torture of inmates in American prison, the American prison system, again, who are disproportionately non-white people. And I've argued elsewhere that solitary confinement, mass incarceration, and the sexual assault of prisoners combined make the conditions of torture. But yet this treatment of inmates is rarely is ever described as torture. And indeed, in the case of sexual assault, is often the subject of mockery and jokes. So in sum, the ongoing torture of non-white people in the US, it will likely continue unless there is a thoroughgoing public acknowledgement of and reckoning with the history of American torture and the narratives of justification and erasure that I've argued sustain and promulgate the repeated use and erasure of torture of people of colour. But unfortunately, given President Biden's recent assertion that torture, quote, goes against everything we stand for as a nation, and the failure of the Biden administrations and preceding administrations to hold the architects and perpetrators of the post 9-11 torture program accountable, let alone offer any public redress or apology to the victims of torture, we have little reason to hope that such a reckoning will occur. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jessica, for your illuminating remarks. Uh, we'll next hear from Jeffrey. Hey. First off, I want to thank Michael and the uh, program for giving me the opportunity. This is my first opportunity to visit Case Western. I remember when I was teaching at the JAG school with my friend Mike Newton, uh, watching Michael on court TV, commenting on the event for international lawyers, which was the creation of the ICTY and the first trial. And we certainly have come a long way since then. Also like to say hello to Jimmy, I think you were my professor of international law when I was in the basic course in 19... Well, I'll leave that alone. It was in the 1900s. We'll agree on that. Okay. Um, so what I want to do very briefly is try and uh, draw together my sense of how the legal academy especially and lawyers writ more broadly have fundamentally changed the way U.S. and in many ways our allied military commanders conceptualize the notion of legitimacy of military operations. When I was at the JAG school with Mike and we were watching Mike Scharf on TV and Jimmy Johnson was teaching us international humanitarian law, rules of war, uh, law related to the conduct of military operations was a genuine niche. There were very, very few people who were interested in it. Uh, there, that really, you could kind of count on one or two hands the big names in the field. And then 9-11 happens. And suddenly there's an explosion of interest because we know that there were so many aspects of it, not just the perception that the United States may be overreaching or was overreaching, some of the comments or points that my, our prior speaker made, but generally the notion that we had been the victim of an attack. That was just not something we had anticipated. And I think the general mood of the nation and the political leadership following the attacks of 9-11 was aggressive uh, and a desire to be able to show the world that we can leverage our combat power, this immense combat power, to punish the people who were responsible for what happened. But it didn't take long for the American people, Congress, the world to start to raise questions about the legitimacy 
of many of our actions in that response. So I think the Legal Academy, because of this interest, saw an explosion of very smart, very talented, very insightful uh, academics who started to get interested in the law that defines legitimacy in the conduct of military operations. And those were the ones that were already there. There was an entire crop, if you will, of future law professors who grew up in an environment where this was the cutting edge issue. And so there was naturally a much greater critique of the relationship between the conduct of military operations, counterterrorism operations, security operations, and international and domestic law that started to influence the perception of legitimacy within the institution itself. I think that was a very positive thing. At the strategic level, leaders started to recognize that the widespread expectation of respect for law during the planning and execution of operations. In other words, we're not just looking at the mistakes that happen and focusing on criminal accountability for those mistakes. There's an expectation that when you send people off to foreign lands to represent the United States, that they conduct themselves in accordance with a legal and moral framework that's widely accepted. Leaders started to see respect for law, both actual and perceived, as a touchstone for legitimacy at the strategic level. At the operational level, the nature of the predominant nature of military operations, counterinsurgency, led to a very rapid and increased recognition by commanders at all levels that the perception of legitimacy among the populations with which they were interacting is going to be decisive in achieving those operational success um, criteria. So this whole notion of legitimacy starts to in influence every phase of planning and execution of military operations and ultimately finds its way into U.S. joint doctrine. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the military, doctrine is kind of the how-to. It's not a perfect answer to everything, but it's the how-to guide, and there's doctrine for everything. <laughs> joint publication 3-0 is the, the high-level capstone doctrine for the pre preparation and execution of joint military operations. And if when Mike and I and Jimmy learn doctrine, we learn principles of effective military operations, things like mass and economy of force and surprise and security. But if you look at that doctrine now, elevated to one of those principles of effective military operations is the principle of legitimacy. That is a remarkable evolution of military thinking where military leaders at the highest level have incorporated into the doctrine that guides the planning of joint operations an imperative that commanders at every level understand the value of legitimacy. And here's what the doctrine actually says in defining legitimacy. Legitimacy, which can be a decisive factor in operations, is based on the actual and perceived legality morality and rightness of actions from the various perspectives of interested audiences. These audiences will include our national leadership and domestic population, governments and civilian populations in the operational area, and nations and organizations around the world. So I would say it's now beyond question that there is a direct relationship between the, the reality and the perception of compliance with law and the legitimacy and effectiveness of military operations. And you just have to look at a couple of examples that teach commanders the kind of immense corrosive effect of service members or units making mistakes or even doing things deliberately illegal that that will have on the overall perception and effectiveness of military operations. Abu Ghraib was mentioned. Uh, the CIA had, uh, enhanced interrogation program was mentioned the attack on the hospital in Kunduz, Afghanistan, that tragedy. Um, the most recent incident involving the drone attack in, uh, in Kabul during the evacuation operation that was ongoing and, and, and the storm that that's created. When Mike and I, Mike Newton and I were in the JAG school, we had a general come and speak to us about a concept he coined called the strategic corporal. And his theory was a corporal on a checkpoint 
in Bosnia this morning can make a mistake that has strategic consequences by tonight. This is the imperative of legitimacy, and it cre creates a very different type of challenge and responsibility, I think, for both the military and the legal academy. So let me start with the military. From the military perspective, it means we've got to grow leaders who understand that law is not the domain of some JAG officer who it's just a technical box you have to check. They have to understand that the morality and legitimacy of everything they and their subordinates do is going to be based on a legal foundation. They must embrace the law. As a matter of fact, I wrote a little piece for the Red Cross Review a couple of years ago that I, I still think is the one thing I've written that I, I would actually enjoy going back to read again. I call myself a fire and forget author, right? I, I don't like to go back and look what I've read before because I start to cringe. But this, this little piece focused on rethinking the meaning of the phrase responsible command. So for those of you studying international criminal law, when I say command responsibility, you instinctively think of a mode of liability, the Yamashita standard, the newer should have known standard. But I think that phrase has very different meaning. If you go back to 1899 to the first regulations that were adopted internationally that had to be adopted by the states for their armed forces, the next regulations to the Hague Convention, it lays out the criteria that makes an individual privileged to engage in hostilities and war. Those criteria included wearing a fixed distinctive emblem, carrying your arms openly, being part of an organization that respected the laws and customs of war, and operating under responsible command. Now, for me, that had profound significance because what it told me was that the entire international legal system has an expectation that it's military commanders that will train, discipline, and oversee the execution of military operations in a way that demonstrates respect for international law. As I like to say, you don't get qualified to be a privileged belligerent because you operate under a responsible lawyer. You get qualified because you operate under a responsible commander. So what does that responsibility entail? I think historically is it, it has entailed ensuring a genuine embracing of the responsibility of your subordinates to conduct their operations in accordance with law. But today, I think that imperative is exponentially higher because respect for the law is such a decisive element in critiquing military operations. So for the institution, it means you have to do a better job of developing commanders who embrace their obligation under the law. And I think this is really important when we think about the evolving nature of conflict. Uh, the, the biggest mistake military leaders can make is assume that the conflict of tomorrow will be like the conflict of yesterday. The era of COIN is coming to an end. If we could transport all of you to the National Training Center or the Joint Readiness Training Center, you would see U.S. military forces preparing vigorously for what they call peer-to-peer -peer or near-peer conflict. In other words, you're going to be fighting an enemy that can match you relatively toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And if it happens in a place like Korea or Europe, let's hope it never does, then what it's going to involve is fast-paced, information-denied, uh, rapid combined arms maneuver operations. And those commanders are not going to have the luxury of being able to contemplate every attack decision in a deliberate decision-making process where they have the benefit of a legal advisor giving them advice. They're going to have to make time-sensitive judgments, and they will become the decisive elements in whether or not there is actual and perceived legitimacy of operations, particularly when they're fighting an enemy that knows legitimacy is an Achilles heel for democracies and will try and create situations where they can't avoid inflicting civilian casualties or destruction of civilian property. And that brings me what I think is the challenge for the academy. I think the challenge for the academy is to make sure that you truly under, that members of the academy truly understand the nature of the context of the law they're analyzing and how that context influences how the, the assessment of compliance. 
specifically an understanding of military operations and the challenges commanders face. Now, those challenges don't justify noncompliance with the law. But, but one of the most important touchstones of compliance with the law in military operations, particularly combat operations, with all of the rules related to the, the legality of combat operations, is one word, reasonable. Okay, there are very few absolutes in international humanitarian law, especially in the realm of targeting. Yes, there's an absolute prohibition against deliberately attacking a civilian, but that prohibition turns on whether or not the commander made a reasonable judgment that something was or was not a target under the circumstances prevailing at the time. It's an ex ante analysis. So when we as academics or lawyers generally critique the conduct of military operations, I think it's imperative that we avoid the temptation, which is very seductive, of what I've called effects-based condemnations. In other words, we just look at the effects of an attack and draw an ipso facto conclusion that it must have been illegal, because that's not how the, the law functions. What we have to do is our best to understand the obligation to recreate the situation and then ask whether commanders who made the decisions acted within a realm of reasonableness. And actually, it's to that end that, that I did another piece with a friend of mine who works for the Army now, where we suggested in order to facilitate the legitimacy of military operations, the military has to do a better job of thinking about how to arm commanders with the full range of information they need to mitigate civilian risk during operations specifically a proposal to develop what I've called civilian risk mitigation experts as part of the battle command process. So there's a lot of work to be done, and I think the, the Academy deserves great credit for elevating the importance of law and the understanding of law and the um, value of looking at law as a touchstone of legitimacy of military operations. It's made the military better by making them come to terms with the importance of that consideration. But I also think there's an accord and obligation on the academy to make sure that when you are critiquing military operations and security operations, you can preserve your own legitimacy in that process by avoiding the temptation to assume too much on the part of the people that have to make very difficult, time-sensitive decisions. And I would say uh, the, the incident in Afghanistan is a prime example because I am very personally connected with a drone operator, and nobody can suggest to me that that was a calculated and deliberate attack on 12 innocent civilians. It was a tragic mistake. What we need to be doing is asking how that mistake occurred and how those type of mistakes can occur, can be avoided in the future. That's a productive discussion. What's not a productive discussion is a knee-jerk accusation of widespread or deliberate violation of the law, because I don't think when you strip the, the, the lift the rock up, that's what you would find. Thank you. Deborah? Oh, great. Um, Thank you. Uh, I'm still reflecting on Jeff's remarks. Um, first, I want to thank Avi Cover, uh, who is one of the best young human rights lawyers I've ever worked with. I am shocked, shocked to find him here as a tenured professor of law. Um, uh, but I'm thrilled to have the chance to see him again and Michael Scharfer hosting um, this wonderful event. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, the past month has given me a number of occasions to reflect on um, the impact of 9-11 uh, on my law school in City. I teach in New York. Cardozo was in the village the day of the attack. Many of my colleagues uh, had to evacuate. Um, we lost a number of alumni of a law school that day, um, and, and the law school has been occupied with some of its own reflections of that time. Um, also on the social and cultural impact of those events on the life of the nation, and of course, um, probably primarily uh, on uh, the impact of those events on US governance and, and law. Uh, but this conference is the first occasion, or preparing for this conference is the first occasion to think about um, how the academy itself 
shaped the U.S. response or changed the shape of the U.S. response, as I asked um, whether academics, whether and to what extent academics served as a catalyst for legal change uh, post 9-11. And I think the answer to that question posed in that way is absolutely and unquestionably yes. Um, the academy had a significant impact, uh, but it wasn't always to the good. And as we grapple with these mammoth challenges that are facing the United States today from the rise of white supremacists and uh, movements in domestic terrorism here at home, along with profound threats to voting rights and election administration and democracy itself. Um, now is a good time for academics to reflect on um, uh, on on what it was that we did uh, that worked and what what worked less well. So what I want to do in in these remarks uh, briefly, I hope, is. Um, uh, First, to understand academy, the Academy's impact on uh, the events, the U.S. response to the attacks of 9-11, I need to say a few words to just back up to where we were on 2000, where the Academy was, and where the study of national security law and international law stood on 9-11. Um, and then I'll turn to the, I think, more complicated question of um, the ways in which the Academy and academics changed the course of the U.S. response. Um, so much has been written about, enormous amounts have been written about the extent to which the U.S. intelligence community um, and others were unprepared for the attacks of 9-11 and for the threat of international terrorism on 9-11. The legal community was, in core respects, intensely unprepared uh, as well. Um, most international law professors, certainly in the sort of top 20 law schools at the time, top 10 law schools, had themselves attended law school in either the 1970s or early 1980s. Um, uh, so this was, they were learning law, they were in your shoes, right after Vietnam, in which there had been a series of court cases challenging the legality of the war, all of which the courts had declined to hear in any uh, substantive way. Um, they were teaching at a time before the United States had ratified any of the major international human rights treaties, which doesn't happen until the 1990s. Um, they were teaching before set aside uh, the nature of doctrine and the incorporation of legitimacy. They were teaching before uh, the U.S. Army Field Manual was updated, which happened after the attacks of My Lai, um, to describe the object of wartime detention operations for the first time after Vietnam, not as just the acquisition of maximum intelligence information, but as the implementation of the Geneva Conventions. Um, and their own law professors, right, the folks they had learned law from, were trained in law before the modern Geneva Conventions came into force. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, and indeed 90s, ROTC uh, was still banned from campuses at almost every single one of the major Ivy Leagues, a hangover, a holdover from conflicts between the civilian academy and the military that dates back to the 1960s and was reinvigorated in the 1990s with uh, gays in the military, uh, the challenge over the policy that prohibited uncloseted uh, lesbian, gays, and, and, and others from, from serving in the military openly. Um, and so the military itself and this kind of dialogue was still not happening on many campuses and certainly many of our most um, prestigious campuses. Um, the law had, over the course of the lifetimes of the folks who were teaching in the academy on 9-11, developed a huge amount in a short period of time. Um, uh, and it had a huge amount now to say about the regulation of force um, and the legal conduct of war. Um, but the overwhelming view among American academics after the attacks of 9-11, looking at the um, challenges arising out of the U.S. response, was that the law, and courts especially, would have very little to say, or nothing at all to say, about the legality of U.S. counterterrorism policies to emerge, right? Court cases were expected to go nowhere and, and and that was as was to be expected. Jeff is entirely right. The attacks of 9-11 in the U.S. response didn't pr produce this enormous surge and really transformation of the academy and how we approach the study of international security and international law. In the 1999-2000 legal school year, neither Harvard nor Yale nor Stanford offered a course in national security law. Um, by 2012, more than 125 different law schools in the United States had standalone courses in national security law, and that doesn't include separate courses called things like um, 
you know, intelligence law or counterterrorism law or things like that. Um, at least by 2012, again, we had at least five different national security law casebooks uh, that were available. The courts by then had had a steady stream of cases involving core topics of detention and, of course, the military commission trials and many others. And scholars were already, myself included, writing about the relative normalization of international and national security law topics in the law. The prospect for the first time, which was not remotely what I was taught in law school, that we would start to see the courts treat national security and international law cases rather more like they treated at least patent law cases, or rather more like they treated uh, cases that they would encounter uh, every season in the ordinary course. Um, at the same time, we saw this, I think, wonderful development. The Ivy Leagues moved from a, a point in which ROTC was banned from campus entirely, just for example, to uh, an effort as the cohort of veterans coming out of the Iraq and Afghan, uh, Afghanistan conflicts grew, uh, to reach out to the military community, provide funding to increase the number of um, uh, veterans who were able to afford legal education. Um, and, and I think this and many other sort of cooperative efforts between the civilian and military academies were one of the few wonderful ways in which we were able to ease an otherwise horrific um, civil-military gap and who was paying attention to these issues in the United States. Um, on 9-11, right, the person who was the general counsel to the National Security Council in the White House, a wonderful lawyer, at least enormously well-educated lawyer, named John Bellinger, who then went on to become the State Department legal advisor under Bush, had never taken a course in international law, right? Today, it is almost inconceivable for me to imagine the incoming, indeed it is not the case, that the incoming uh, folks who are filling these positions are in the same kind of position. And in that respect, I think we have come a long way, again, in a remarkably short period of time. So how then to understand the impact that the academy had on the war and the U.S. response to it? Because we were learning, uh, the academy was learning, really rapidly, along with everybody else in the United States, um, a lot of uh, what had not been the subject of intense academic um, focus before. Again, there were people, so there were certainly people who focused on these and were experts in this topic, but it was a significant, significant minority of the academy. So given that unpreparedness, and perhaps in part because the government, the U.S. government, was equally unprepared on these legal questions. Academics were able to and did have a remarkable impact. And some of this work is just extraordinary work. And for everything else I'm about to say that is less extraordinary, um, I don't want to give this short shrift at all. Of the first four major Supreme Court cases that were argued coming out of the 9-11 era, two of them were argued by then serving law professors, Jenny Martinez out at Stanford and Neil Katyal, who was then a professor at Georgetown. Um, law professors were involved constantly as amici and doing incredibly influential writing in all kinds of venues uh, as advocates, as public servants. Um, and a lot of this work was really extraordinary work and, and made a wonderful contribution to the development of international law. On the other hand, at the same time, one had Professor John Yu on leave from his tenured position at Berkeley Law School come into the Bush administration and write that we need not consider ourselves bound by international law or other legal obligations against torture. Uh, Alan Dershowitz, professor at Harvard Law School, wrote a book um, talking about, you know, it's inevitable that we're going to be engaged in torture. Now what we really need to do is have a system of torture warrants so that we can, um, so that we can do it that way. Um, but even sort of weighing the there were good and bad contributions that academics make, I think underestimates the sort of subtle ways in which a large part of the community of academia um, influenced the development of the dialogue. Um, 
in, in which academics can and do have um, an influence on the development of the law. One of the most challenging critiques, I think, that have been raised about legal work post 9-11 in the realm of international humanitarian law, international human rights law, has been the prospect that the centrality of legal analysis in US decision making, the very centrality of legal analysis in US decision making did more to enable than to constrain US operations in detention and targeting and warfare fighting more broadly. And folks from Jack Goldsmith, Harvard law professor, to my colleague at um, Cardozo, Becca Ingber, um, have made versions of this argument. Um, that is, uh, right, Goldsmith argued uh, all of these challenging and challenging court cases and, and uh, new acts of Congress succeeded in sort of modulating and to some extent better regulating what the map of the war on terror looked like, but didn't fundamentally change it. It legitimated it in a way that made it easier for the Obama administration to continue uh, to pursue. Um, Becca's made sort of analogous arguments, but the most dramatic is a new book that is getting a staggering amount of attention by Yale law professor Samuel Moyne. I cannot recommend the book to you, but I can recommend some good reviews of it that have been written. I, I can't recommend the book to you because I think it is it is catastrophically wrong in key respects. Um, but Moyne's argument, right, at one extreme is that the proliferation and understanding of international humanitarian law, the humanization of the conduct of war, making war less bloody, in effect, prolonged the conflict, right, has made it longer for, it made it possible for the United States to stay at war longer. Now, I want to be clear. I think Moyne's argument is at one extreme and is wrong in multiple ways that I won't <laughs> I won't pretend to catalog here. He offers broadly two causal pathways for how the embrace of humanitarian standards in war has helped prolong war. One causal pathway is that it tamped down the movement that otherwise would have arisen domestically against war as rose during Vietnam that would have succeeded in politically ending the wars sooner. Um, and another causal pathway is through its impact on uh, senior officials and lawyers in government who were making decisions during the Obama administration and others. Um, path one, that is the notion that but for, you know, had only we been killing more people and bombing civilians indiscriminately, um, there, there would have been a popular uprising in the United States. It's entirely unexplicated in the book how this exactly would have happened and almost certainly wrong. Americans inattention and non-opposition to um, war or at least non-active opposition of late is overdetermined. There is a serious question of how much attention people actually pay to this. In the three presidential debates in the 2020 election campaign, not a single question was asked of either candidate about the war in Afghanistan. Um, there is a tiny fraction of Americans, less than half of 1%, who actually serve in the military at any given time. Um, it's not at all clear, perhaps most daunting of all, that knowledge of the great inhumanity of um, the U.S. war um, or a, a less humane war would have actually prompted opposition. On the contrary, for the first decade after the attacks on 9-11, one of the most popular shows on television was 24, which was primarily about the efficacy of torture. Um, and, and of course, um, the U.S. response to COVID with 600,000 deaths has been um, less than one might have hoped. But I do think there's a point there, um, not in Moyne's book per se, but in this body of scholarship that is worth taking seriously. And that is the idea that legal analysis in this realm is powerful. It is made by academic experts who are smart, um, who have spent a lot of time studying this, and their words have an effect both broadly and in direct advice in their capacity as counsel. And it is possible, and I, I did a study in which I um, interviewed about uh, just more than three dozen people who served in senior national security policy positions in the Bush and Obama administration from 2001 to 2017. Um, it'll be published soon, but it's on SSRN now. Um, from the cabinet secretary level to national senior director at the National Security Council level to try to understand the extent to which legal advice had an impact on their decision making. Um, and I found that it had an enormous impact. Um, many of them said some version of 
legal thinking suffused the complete um, process of policy choice. It set the framework. And in some respects, that's good. That is exactly what we want. But to the extent this makes it possible for policymakers to avoid other kinds of decision making that they need to be engaged in, namely moral calculations that are not addressed by law in this realm, and policy calculations that are not, and strategy calculations that are not addressed in law by this realm, law can become an excuse, a stand-in for analyses that are otherwise um, not being made. IHL doesn't care, uh, in, as it applies, about the justness or morality of the initial conflict or its strategic wisdom or anything else. Um, but policymakers absolutely should. So lawyers as academics writing for the public, certainly lawyers serving in capacity um, as government lawyers and others, um, need to, I think, exercise a profound degree of humility not to suggest that law can stand in as a sort of moral guardian of um, decision making in wartime and not to overclaim. Um, we went into this with a vast um, chasm of a lack of knowledge of military, of security, of law. Um, we overclaimed heavily in the early years uh, and, and we have plenty left to learn as well. I'll stop. Well, thank you to all three panelists. Uh, we have about 30 minutes. And um, I'm going to first give uh, Shannon French an opportunity to, to ask the first question, offer some comments. Uh, and then we'll hopefully panelists may have questions for one another for a few minutes. And then we'll certainly open it up to the, to the group as a whole. Well, first, uh, as, as everyone has, I, I want to thank the organizers and, and thank Michael for putting this entire conversation uh, together uh, for this conference because it is the right time to be looking at this and having um, perhaps some really deep reflections on what we've done and, and what we can do going forward. I was, as you heard in my introduction, I was uh, teaching at the Naval Academy when 9-11 happened. And I also remember, and I heard so many echoes of this, how uh, the shift occurred even amongst those of us like me who did military ethics as our primary focus, we had been geared towards this concept that most upcoming operations would be humanitarian interventions. We were trying to understand our roles in, in those kinds of, uh, of uh, conflicts. And we're not, I think, any more ready <laughs> than anyone else uh, to make this shift. Uh, but then we were able to draw on the long just war tradition to try to bring it together. And I also just wanted to point out the, the threads across uh, our three excellent speakers from, uh, from Jessica to Jeffrey to Deborah. We heard recurring themes around points of identity, the fact that the United States pretty desperately wants to feel like the good guys, wants to present itself that way, take legitimacy from that. Uh, and that has obviously good and bad consequences. On the one hand, you have the effect of erasure, where there's a, a desire to mask and not confront the things that might destroy that identity. And this claim to being more civilized that requires us to turn away from what actually happened. But I also think there's an incredibly important point that came through uh, in both Jeffrey's comments and, and Deborah's around a disconnect that can happen with academics who don't have much interaction with the military of thinking that those in the military actually living through these choices don't want to deal with the complexity and the nuance. Uh, that's simply not true. I actually have encountered much more of that kind of pushback from civilians who have nothing to do <laughs> with the military. And I have not encountered that from the military. They understand the complexity and what you were calling the context, of course, and they want help with it. So there actually is this tremendous desire to say, you know, no, I'm not feeling threatened that you're thinking this through in academic and legal terms. I really would like some help because at the end of the day, if there is another tragic uh, action, 
they're the ones who are living with it. So w with that in mind, I, I wanted to ask um, each of you if you could just briefly comment on, in your own experiences, have you had to silence uh, the voices of those who think that everything we're talking about here is some kind of academic fantasy that, uh, you know, that the concerns about the law or concerns about ethics uh, are um, not practical and don't matter in the real world. I know I have. I'm wondering what your experiences have been. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, yes. And interestingly, I share your experience that in most cases, the most dismissive of law in war are people who have never even come close to contemplating what it's like to have another person tell you to shoot or attack mm -hmm. another human being. By the way, the, the, the discussion of the book, I'm just, I mean, my first reaction is I think General Sherman wrote that book during the Civil War <laughs> when he said, I'm going to make war so painful for the South that they'll never rise oh. up again in a thousand in a thousand years. And then the other thing I love is when you hear people say, well, if we had had been more aggressive, if we had bombed more civilians, guess what? It's not we. Mm -hmm. It's, as Deborah says, one percent of the American population. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that in, that really gets me going is that type of commentary, because if you know people who've had to make that awful decision, if you know commanders who've had to make the awful proportionality judgment where they are making a calculated decision to kill innocent people because the, the value of the target justifies it, or if you know people who've made mistakes in combat and taken the life of, of someone they thought was a, an enemy and found out is a civilian, and you see the way that that tortures them, then it would be a little, you ought to be a little bit more reticent about, well, we should just bomb more people, or we should, tor it's not we. It's a young man or woman that's given an order to do something. And they have to live with the consequences of their brutal action for the rest of their lives. They're not cyborgs. Interestingly, the place where I've encountered that the most was at a conference in Israel that was, that was um, attended primarily by American lawyers who were getting CLE credit by doing this visit in Israel. And, and I, along with some colleagues, Ken Watkin, Dick Jackson, we were talking about the imperative of law in war, and we were getting attacked. And finally, at the, I, finally, there was one gentleman in the front with a young man, looked about 20 years old, and I said to him, maybe I'm wrong, but I'll speculate that neither you nor your son have ever been in a uniform for the United States. And he said, that's right. I said, well, you ought to be cautious about being so cavalier. He said something like, I don't understand why we just can't kill all the Palestinians if they're supporting uh, Hamas. And I said, because it's not you who's going to be doing it. It's my son or somebody else's son. So before you say that they should kill innocent people, you ought to think twice about it. I agree with you absolutely. It's the people that have to deal with the reality of war that tend to be most, I'm not going to say most, right? I mean, people suffer the consequence of war, but are very sensitive to being able to to bring their soldiers into combat and bring them out of combat with a sense of moral clarity. And the law, like it or not, is the, is the foundation of that moral clarity. Go ahead, Jess. That's a, really, uh, that's a really interesting question to me because on the one hand, um, I've certainly, <laughs> perhaps ironically, the, the torture debate in academia, well, at least certainly in philosophy, but also even in sort of media or popular debates, played out this fantasy of torture, this sort of hypothetical ticking bomb scenarios. Um, and often myself and others criticised the development and use of this fantasy as bearing absolutely no relation whatsoever to the reality of the torture program that was being used. And the pushback I would get is that, yes, but, you know, <laughs> philosophers should be concerned with the hypothetical, theoretical aspect of torture and not with the reality of torture. Um, but, of course, one of the things I, I expand a bit more on in the paper than I did in my talk is that the, this torture fantasy actually played an important role in providing a justificatory story about torture that made its way into, for example, the OLC memos. 
So there was actually a very direct link between the kind of academic so-called pure theoretical discussion of torture, which is supposedly what philosophers were supposed to be doing, and the reality of the normalisation of the torture program. So, mm -hmm. so that was sort of my experience, at least in relation to, to that debate. Um, thanks. So um, this is a great question. I want to say one thing, and I can't believe I'm in this position, but if I were Samuel Moyne, speaking in his own defence, right, because I, you know, he's not here to defend himself, I suspect he would say, I, you know, I am not arguing in this book for more brutal conflict. I am arguing for less war altogether. And I think, right, so that, that just to put that out there for, for what it's worth, um, uh, we, you know, which is, which is important. Um, with respect to the question of how much folks care about law in decision-making positions, right? So um, I, I made a decision. It, it seemed clear to me, and there have been studies, and I've met enough folks like Jeff over the years um, and, and, and worked with others in lots of settings, JAG lawyers and so forth, who are actually advising uh, or have been advising in the field. It was very clear to me that they, they cared intensely <laughs> about what the legal rules was, so much so that I thought, you know, where I could make a contribution is in figuring out if at the level of high politics, right, they care about it there at all either. Um, and, and that's harder, right, because of the population I surveyed. Um, some had military service, but the vast majority did not. Um, and, you know, again, it was a, a mixed population. So half from the Bush, roughly half from the Bush, roughly half from the Obama years. Um, and And I'll just give two examples of I think that might be useful in illustrating. Um, I think what I came away from this study thinking is that we have underestimated the extent to which government lawyers are influential and are unconstrained in the nature of their influence. And the reforms coming out of this, to me, are reforms about cabining the legal advising process almost more than anything else. But but the two stories are this. So, um, I, some of these folks I couldn't believe uh, decided to speak to me. It was a confidential study. So it had to go through the IRB and so forth. Maybe they were comforted by that. But, you know, we had sued the Secretary of Defense under the Bush administration when I was in human rights law. So I was delighted that some of them proved willing to talk. Um, one who um, was somebody I would never have imagined spoke to me, served during the Bush administration, characterized the U phenomenon the John Yu phenomenon, the extent to which they were able to, there was a certain cadre, you know, there's a fight among lawyers within the Bush administration. There was, there was sort of John Yu's on the one hand and more moderate lawyers like John Bellinger and later Jack uh, Goldsmith, who came into the administration, who had, you know, somewhat different views and, and more than somewhat different views. Um, he described the initial lawmaking process in the um, Bush administration as lawyers going off in a room by themselves, one particular cadre of lawyers going off in the room by themselves in the absence of policymaking clients and coming back and saying, let me, here's, you can do all this stuff, right? Um, and the reaction in the Pentagon among policymakers and in other parts of the State Department and in other parts of the government was... Um, well, we don't, we don't necessarily want to do that. It's great to know we have this power, but we don't, you know. Um, and so there was a total disconnect. He said it was the, 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 he said it was exactly the way not to use a lawyer, right? Have them go do their work on their own, and then and then later talk to us. What would have been better would have been an initial conversation. Now, you know, again. All of these people have their own fish to fry, so take it for what it's worth. But that was at least his account. Um, in the Obama administration side, there was this fascinating, um, and there have been wonderful books. Charlie Savage, who's a journalist, wrote a wonderful book about lawyering in the Obama administration. Um, but one of the most interesting conversations I had was with somebody who um, was there um, with President Obama trying to decide about whether to use more force in Syria. You know, after this red line with the use of chemical weapons in Syria is now the time to, on humanitarian grounds, go use more military force and so forth. Um, and at least four different people expressed to me, you know, one of the key hangups there was uh, we could never get to where it was legal. Right, under international law, going to this is pre ISIS, right? Going to war with Syria over their use of chemical weapons in Syria. And the fifth person said, Yes, that's true. Um, but I thought in that context that Obama viewed uh, the law as something of an out, 
knowing that there was a serious legal argument that this was illegal, gave him a justification for not doing something he didn't really want to do anyway. Um, and that sort of centrality of how law can matter and the different ways it, it can matter, both in constraining the use of force or enabling the use of force, um, and the ways in which policymakers and deciders rely on lawyers centrally in sort of crafting their initial decision making, I think is a lesson that um, I'm still figuring out how to unpack, even though we're now in the sight check stage. So I got to figure it out soon. <laughs> I'll stop. Thank you to you all for really Helpful observations. Um, I wonder, I noticed another through line through through all three of your comments. And um, that was, you know, we're, we're all here. We're in a law school setting. We teach students learn law. You learn what are the rules. Um, but all of you noted um, sort of that, a, that a, a mechanistic legal analysis is not is not sufficient really here, right? The, the query, is it what's the law, actually isn't always going to be the appropriate question. Uh, and, and each of you really sort of, I think, fronted that morality um, is, is, is a concern. Jeff, you, you noted in your definition of legitimacy uh, that it's an actual and perceived legality, but also morality and the rightness of those acts, right, as, as others perceived. Jessica, you, you characterize torture as, as a moral marker, right, that, that the legal definition doesn't take that into account and sort of the whole dehumanization of, of the victim. Uh, and Deborah, as you sort of just noted, I think, in, and in your paper you do as well, sort of somewhat characterizing, criticizing even the Obama administration's lawyerliness, right? And, and you wrote, in fact, that uh, the post 9-11 years raised the prospect that the analysis of an action's legality could too easily stand in for assessment of an action's moral, strategic, or practical admissibility. Um, and indeed, I think some of this is sort of reminiscent of, of Mark Ellis's call uh, for really looking further and deeper at, at, at moral uh, elements. So I guess I ask for each of you, um, and maybe it's a very basic question, but I don't know how much we do teach it in the law schools. How do law schools and, and other sources of schools of higher education uh, teach not just law, but morality? I don't teach in a law school. So <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, so I, as you know, I'm in a philosophy department. So of course we, we have courses on ethics. I will say this, that I think that one of the fundamental things we teach um, philosophy students often in, in, in introductory classes is precisely the distinction between law and morality. Mm -hmm. That's one of the very, very first fundamental things we say, because often students come into class thinking that, well, if something is legal, that means it's moral, or if something is, is illegal, that means it's morally wrong, and they conflate those two concepts. So making that distinction seems to me, and I would assume, correctly, I hope, that, that law students you know, come into law school with a good understanding of that distinction to begin with. I mean, the mala in se, mala prohibita distinction mm -hmm. is also one which is valuable to teach the philosophy students as well, which I have taught, right? Um, so, you know, one of the ways I think I talked about that distinction actually in the context of torture and thinking about the way, for example, you tended to view the prohibition of torture as a little bit like a, a mala, my Latin is terrible, how does anyone know what Latin sounds like? Um, my ma mala probita is something that was, was only wrong because it had been prohibited, but the prohibition didn't reflect some deeper underlying belief in the fundamental moral wrongness of torture. Um, and that seemed to be the kind of attitude that the, the at least the U team developed towards the moral wrongness of torture. So I guess I think more broadly in terms of international law and IHL in law schools, you know, really ensuring that law students understand the sort of normative foundations of international law um, to avoid this assumption that, well, you know, if we can show that an action is technically legal, then we don't need to be concerned with its moral justification. To avoid that kind of reasoning, I think, is also a fundamental goal that law schools ought to have, particularly in relation to international law. Um, yeah, I mean, that's an enormously difficult question, one I struggle with every day in teaching not just international law, but US constitutional law at a moment in US history when that is, to, to call the subject fraught would be an understatement. Um, uh, I think the easier thing to say maybe is not how to teach it, um, but 
to say what lawyers can do and what lawyers can't do um, and to instill a certain humility. So some parts of the law are re really are awfully clear. You know, the president has to be 35 years old. That's nice that, you know, um, and some parts of international humanitarian law are like that, too, in certain applications and even use ad bellum. Um, and, and, and those matter enormously. Um, and we're good at them and we're good at using cases and we're good at all of that stuff. But there are plenty of circumstances and the more senior you get in decision making, you know, the, the more of these decisions bubble up to you where the law runs out. It's just not clear. It doesn't answer the question. There are different options. And there has been a view. Um, uh, there is a view uh, among the lawyers in the Obama administration and others again, not all of them, because they are divided amongst themselves in this view, um, that the lawyer's job is to say what's legally available, right? What is the maximum amount of what's legally available, right? It doesn't have to be the best argument. It doesn't have to be the best view of the law, but just is this possible, right? And that was certainly the, I, they wouldn't have put it in those words, but that was certainly the approach that um, many of the early Bush administration lawyers took to, to writing uh, what they wrote. Um, there is another approach a lawyer could take, which is an educator, to be an educator, to tell your client who is smart, <laughs> right, and who cares very much what the smart lawyers think, because law is at least concrete and these policy judgments are really hard and they would like to get out of having to make them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, here's the best case I can make that this is illegal, and here is the best case I can make that this is legal. And if you have a policymaker who is determined to exercise to the limits of his authority, right, that where those limits are will come out of that analysis. And if you have a policymaker who is looking for a legitimate out for a course of policy for which there is political pressure to pursue, um, the law can provide in the opposite direction a course away from that policy that the policymaker thinks is morally wrong, strategically disadvantageous, otherwise a mistake. Um, and, and I think um, understanding, even if you don't have a policy that tells you that's what kind of lawyer you should be, understanding the limits of what lawyers can do and how credible lawyers are seen because we have this expertise and specialized body of law, right? Um, just a little bit more learning a little humility in, in how much the law can answer, I think, is what I do. So I, I think that... Um Anybody who served as a legal advisor learns very quickly that your value to your client is far more than just your technical expertise in the law. I had a general in the JAG Corps tell us once that your client doesn't care if you're the best soldier, doesn't care if you can run the fastest, doesn't care if you're the smartest person in the, in the organization. They rely on you for one word, judgment, because you're more than just a um, expert on the law, you're an advisor. I actually think that this is an area of law school that is woefully under addressed. And part of that is because of the way we teach professional responsibility. If you go to most professional responsibility classes, what you're learning as a student is what you're not allowed to do. And what we should be teaching you is what you should be doing. And ironically, there's a rule uh, for professional responsibility, ABA rule 2.1, the lawyer as the advisor. A lawyer may refer not only to law, but to other considerations such as moral, economic, social, and political factors that may be relevant to a client's situation. So as a future lawyer, my view is your first responsibility is to know what the law permits and what it prohibits. There's a saying among military legal advisors, just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. But if it's illegal, it's always wrong, right? And what, what our commanders would ask us for is our sense not only of legality, but rightness. Not because we have some type of monopoly on figuring out what's moral or right. But when you were in orientation as new law students, my suspicion is somebody got up in front of you and talked about the way law school is going to change the way you think. It's going to change the way you work through problems. It's going to teach you an analytical methodology. And the truth is that that's probably the most important thing you learn in law school. The substantive law you learn, if you're in criminal law, 
You're learning a common law code that is not in any statute verbatim in any state in the union. But what you're learning is a methodology of how to solve problems. And that methodology involves factors that are moral and political and economic and social. And if we're not emphasizing that, if we're not reminding students that every case they read is much more profound than black ink on white paper, then we're missing an opportunity for, for, to prepare you for the challenge that you are going to confront when you get out in the world and a client says to you, what do you think we should do? Not, I want to do this, tell me it's legal. If that's the type of client you have, look for another job. What do you think we should do? And you, you got to know the law because they're not going to know it. But everything that, that my friend Deborah said is right on point at national level policymaking. There may be times when somebody's looking for a reason not to do something that they're feeling pressured to do. And your expertise in the law may guide them in that direction. And there may be other times when your over aggressiveness to create a zone of permissible conduct tempt somebody to do something they otherwise wouldn't do. So your comment, Deborah, about go in the room, come up with the, all the stuff you're allowed to do, and then you come back to the meeting and someone says, well, we didn't really want to do all that. What worries me is there's someone in the meeting who hears that and says, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I didn't realize we could do that. And then you're taking them in a direction that is not really where they, they would have gone had you been more responsive to the fundamental question what do you think we should do? So I agree that it's, a, it's an undervalued aspect of legal education, but one that you'll get as students if you do things like the clinical opportunities and working with Professor Johnson, and, and you get to see the intersection of law, policy, and humanity, because that's a world where lawyers work. Just to very briefly follow, follow up on that, the, um, Harold Coe is a law professor at Yale, but served in the Obama administration, served in variety capacities in different over different periods of time. He used to talk about things, be, telling telling clients, policy making clients, that something was lawful but awful. Mm -hmm. You could you could do this, but yuck, right? This is this is bad, or I think this would be bad, or I think this, you know. But it's even worse than giving people ideas, right? There's a, a branch of cognitive studies that suggests when you tell somebody in the throes of decision making, look, this is available or this is, you know, this is possible. That's what they keep last in mind. So even telling somebody lawful but awful may make them more likely um, to pursue that course than they otherwise would. This is not to say this is easy. It is just to say these are the kinds of considerations that I think lawyers have to think their way all the way around when they're working um, in, in advising capacity. I'd just like to follow up on that, actually, because that's, um, that's a, a really good point that when, and it's not just that, you know, cognitively, people might sort of latch on to the last thing they were told as an option, but when something is presented as being on the table, it shapes one's views about what is morally permissible as well. Mm -hmm. And so, and we often think that some things just shouldn't even be on the table. So in a totally different context, for example, if your friend came to you and said, look, I'm, I'm really depressed, what should I do? Um, you might say, I mean, you could say, well, I guess you could commit suicide or you could go to a counsellor, you know, you could go for a walk. But even by putting it on the table, and that's shocking, right, to think that you would even say that to someone that, well, I guess you could commit suicide. But by putting it as an option, it already changes the moral framework of the decisions that are made available, right? And so even when so if a lawyer says, okay, so legally you could torture an inmate, you know, or you could use these other methods of interrogation or you could, I don't know, use some other method of intelligence gathering, just by making it something which is now on the table changes the moral framework in a really profound way. And so, you know, if we think, you know, as lawyers, I guess, and I guess this is a factor in terms of education, it's a bit outside my purview, but, um, you know, if you're teaching, well, just using examples like the example I used with the depressed friend that are shocking but that make that point quite strongly, that some things we just think ought not be on the table as an option that we would present to someone who's making a difficult decision. Um, and that by putting things out there, you actually are shaping, you, you're already creating an aura of moral permissibility around that option that would not be there if it wasn't even sort of on the table. So that was one of my critiques often with the way the torture debate was narrated, is that we're starting from the presumption that it's 
on the table. And we're pretending it's a hypothetical choice rather than one that's already been implemented. Um, and just by doing that, you're already kind of taking a stance about um, the moral permissibility of torture as being something that's now up for debate, whereas perhaps it wasn't before. Thank you to all of you. Um, I want to make sure that we have a couple, we have a few minutes left for any students or anyone else in the room to ask any questions. Oh, Jennifer. Thanks for the panel. So um, I think uh, President Biden said something like um, the U.S. is now no longer at war. So our justification for holding those at Guantanamo is the U.S. was at war with al-Qaeda. So is the U.S. anywhere in a state of armed conflict? Is the threshold met for armed conflict against al-Qaeda? And if not, what is the legality of still having detainees at Guantanamo, given there can only be law of war detentions and not indefinite? Thanks. We'd like to yeah. that one. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll be here another hour. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love how the two philosophers are both like, you guys can yeah, take no, I mean, <laughs> So the detentions of Guantanamo are, they're, they're multiple. Yeah, OK. <laughs> the detentions of Guantanamo, as a matter of US law, are authorized under the statutory authorization for the use of military force and subsequent statutory authorizations that have been passed. Um, the Supreme Court at one point in 2004 said, you need to construe this statute in keeping with our obligations under the Geneva Conventions. That view was codified by Congress in 2011. Um, so there is a strong argument. I wrote a paper in 2014, last time I thought we were at the end of war, um, uh, called Law at the End of War. <laughs> there is a very strong argument now uh, that um, the, the conditions, as Justice O'Connor said in Hamdi, right, no longer attach as a matter of international law, or for that matter, as a pure matter of statutory interpretation for which one does not need international law, um, that these detentions, the, the authorization for them should be understood to run out. Um, and I think that's a powerful argument, and I think it's vastly more powerful now than it was before. Um, as a matter of international law, on the existence of a non-international armed conflict, so setting aside Guantanamo as such, the lack now, the absence of combat troops in Afghanistan makes the claim that there is an ongoing global non-international armed conflict much harder to sustain. On the other hand, we are actively engaged in bombing in multiple other countries, <laughs> including Somalia in particular. Um, so. Um, so it, I think it'll depend what context the is there a non-international armed conflict comes up in, for example, maintaining the legality of U.S. targeting operations in some place like Somalia, the argument will be more complicated. Um, and I could go on for like another hour and a half, but I think maybe I should stop there. Well, right near the end, but Jeff, why don't you have the last word yeah. on? I mean, I think one thing that complicates it is a guy named Kavanaugh. Okay. If you read his opinion in a case called Al-Bahani versus Obama, where al-Bahani made that exact argument. He said, I was a member of the Taliban. Your conflict with the Taliban is over. Under customary principles of international humanitarian law, you have an obligation to promptly repatriate me. And judge then Judge Kavanaugh, in his opinion, at the D.C. Circuit en banc um, case, said, listen, Congress said the president can use all necessary and appropriate force and I don't think you could look to customary international law to qualify that, only to get power, not to lose power. So I, I, I think that the, and the other thing that complicates it, as Deborah notes, is you've got two different categories of detainees there. You have a couple of Taliban, which are the hardest to justify at this point, but you also have Al Qaeda. And the United States always viewed the conflict with Al Qaeda and the conflict with the Taliban as bifurcated not not synonymous. So I think that that was a, a overbroad statement. The United States is no longer at war. We're no longer in a conflict in Afghanistan. But I don't think President Biden believes for a minute that we're no longer in hostilities against Al Qaeda and associated or organized enemy armed groups. Thank you. Thanks to all our panelists. Um, I just want to end with just a couple observations. One, um, you know, Jessica's discussion of uh, the erasure of torture, just want to note um, that one can see sort of that, that taking 
real physical and, and legal embodiment um, in um, the first week of, of arguments that the Supreme Court will undertake, uh, the first week of o October, uh, one of the cases is the Abu Zubaydah case. Mm -hmm. um, that is sort of the, the poster child of the U.S. torture program. And um, attorneys, including uh, most prominently an academic, Joseph Margulies, um, who has been litigating and writing on these issues for, for 20 years now, uh, has brought this case uh, in connection with the European Court of Human Rights uh, investigation and judgment on Poland and their role, uh, and is seeking discovery, is seeking information, in fact, from uh, psychologist uh, James Mitchell, who, who Jessica noted. Um, the United States has asserted state secrets privilege, uh, which means that no information should be provided. Absolute erasure of torture. Uh, and so oral arguments are on Wednesday, October 6th. Uh, you can listen um, to that, 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 that dynamic that, that Jessica spoke to. Um, the other thing I just want to end uh, any good law school class should with a question, uh, and we're going to come, come back maybe full circle to, to one of Omri's observations. And I guess, and it connects with one of Jessica's observations as well. Um, Jessica quite uh, um, powerfully, I think, described uh, a U.S. kind of longstanding practice of torture uh, that seems to have continued from, from colonization uh, through, through the 9-11 attacks. Uh, that would seem to be a state practice uh, of torture, uninterrupted, uh, uh, a policy in many respects. So... Um, can we say that there is a customary international law prohibiting torture, uh, given the prominence of the United States and its practices of torture? Uh, I leave that as a question for the group. We have a break for how long? 30 minutes. Okay, great. 30 minutes to think about it and, and discuss.